that mine in? Which one? This one. For a historical fact, let's look at some early commanders. Here we see, I just have words like this, Alexander and Alexander the Great, roughly around 300 BC, Hannibal roughly 200 BC. Belisarius, Byzantine commander, roughly around 500 AD. Genghis Khan around 1200, Camelot around 1400 AD. And what's my point? All these commanders seem consistent with the ideas of Sun Tzu in one way or the other. But there was a difference between them. The Western commanders I indicate here are more, more directly concerned with winning the battle. Whereas the Eastern commanders were trying to get their adversary all pulled apart before they even hit the army so it comes over and blue. So in that sense, Eastern commanders weren't closely attuned to the ideas of Sun Tzu. Of course, here I'm referring specifically to Genghis Khan and Samuel. Remember, they had access to Sun Tzu stuff. All right, there is some suspicion Belisarius may have had to do with In any case, all of them, one way or another, also plan this chain of Dazzle them here, hose them here. <laughs> Got to get the dazzle first, you set them up with the vulnerability, because the vulnerability is dazzled, you create the vulnerability. And of course, that's the point. Okay, with that in mind, these chain chi notions seem to be rather important. So it leads me to this following comment. Since these seem to be important, I want to get to go over the field for what they mean. First, in a tactical sense, and next, in a battle or grand battle. Chain chi. So let's look at some early notions of what we'd call that we play upon tactics. What we see here, we call about an early tactical theme. In which, the only reason why the date's truncated, 300 BC to 1400 AD, because these weapons start going out around 1400. And you had two kinds of troops, light troops and heavy troops. I'll let you read it, then I'll comment on it. Here, the light troops, how they stick in this statement here, I got the light troops in one sense act as a chain for the heavy troops' chi and vice versa. In other words, the light troops get the guys set up so the heavy troops can pull them apart or vice versa. You see these things unfold. So the intent is quite clear. You can maneuver or agile like the light troops are pounding their heavy extra. Heavy troops are there. So the basic idea behind what we today we call combined arms, complementary arms, is use one arm. And a guy in order to defend against that one arm makes himself vulnerable to the other arm. He tries to defend against the other arm, he makes himself vulnerable to this arm. So you set your combined arms up such that if he tries to work against one, he's vulnerable to the other one. That's the way you play. That's why I like MR2, where you use three hangs here. Try to work against one, weak against another. Once again, that's basically what we're talking about. Okay, with that in mind, let's look at some early battles. Let's make some comments on them. These are typical schematics you see in military uh, books like at West Point and other places. And here we see the Battle of Marathon. They indicate roughly 490 BC. Idealized the match. What you see here, the Greeks with the thinned out thinner heavy wings going against the Persians who outnumber them. It's a very <coughs> uniform array here. The Greeks came down the hill, the center was thrown back, the wings closed in. The Persians, in order to fight the wings, had to change their formation. They're all tightened up. You can imagine they're all glued in there trying to change the formation. What's happening? It generates what? The huge disorder. Came on glue. Right. So here, all you have here is an early indication of what I call a double envelopment, or double out of flank against Steve. I want you to keep that in mind. It's the only one you remember. Not that is an idealized schematic. Another early schematic. <coughs> the Battle of Luther, 371 BC, in which we have at the top here the Spartans, roughly around 11,000, in this rather uniform array. And at the bottom here, we have the Thebans under their commander Epaminondas. Which he heavied up his left, thinned out his center and pulled it or refused his back, thinned out, thinned out his right one, pulled it back or refused it even further with screening troops and the fleet. So from 7,000, 11 versus 7. In any case, at the point of action, though, he had what? A greater fraction of his strength and his adversary won a fantastic victory. And he rolled up. The Pentagon, I mean, the Pentagon, good slip. The Spartan uh, line there. <laughs> <laughs> roll up the spark of mine. So here you see a good example of a single envelopment or single out of flank. That's all I want you to remember. 
How many of you people have read a little harder like that? Remember, he uses battle in a very elegant way. He talks about the oblique order, and you want to be able to display or possess obliquity in battle. Well, you can't store that scheme in your head. That's not going to help you. There is an interesting notion associated with that battle with others. Notice, and I left the disc right out of a Soviet book, a translation of a Soviet book, based on principal operation art time. About the battle of Lutheran, and we're talking about angles of Marx and Engels kind of thing. He understood the significance of it. In other words, unequal distribution of forces across the world. I'm going to point that later on. It's a very important idea, unequal distribution, in order to gain leverage and help Very important idea. As a matter of fact, Sun Tzu understood. For you people who read Sun Tzu, he said it differently, but the same idea. He said, He who prepares and reinforces everywhere is everywhere weak. That applies on equal distribution. He who prepares and reinforces everywhere is everywhere weak. Frederick the Great later on said, He who defends everywhere defends nowhere. Come forward, you'll see that. It's very important in your activities. Matter of fact, I'll preempt myself here. Napoleon, one time, related to the same idea. Napoleon, one time, why he had his marshals construct a defense on France. And it was his time to review it. He looked at it, he saw all these guys strung out along the border. And he said, What are you trying to do? Stop smuggling? <laughs> Same idea, they're trying to defend everything. Okay. We're going to come back to this point, make that point. Now let's look at two more battles and we'll fold up. Battle of Arbella, or probably more appropriately called Gogonet, which we have the uh, Persians under the Persians under Darius and the Greeks under Alexander. The Persians outnumbered Alexander. Alexander brought, brought his wing over here to the Persian left toward his right. And he began to make his advance. The Persians then saw weakness in the uh, Alexander's front, sent some of their troops in here, and that left a gap in their front. Alexander adjusted his stroke and went for that gap. And the result then was inside out single Belgian scheme. Darius, <laughs> very confused, of course, for Darius fled, fled, excuse me, and Alexander won the battle. Very famous battle. Very near the we barely won it, nevertheless, won the battle. One more. The Battle of Canaan. Date indicated, roughly 216 BC. And we see here the Romans under this very uniform array going against the Carthaginians under their commander Hamilton, which he put his weakest troops forward, his better infantry in his left and right wing there, his heavy cavalry in his left, right cavalry, his light cavalry in his right, and the Carthaginian cavalry was actually had about the same number as Roman cavalry, plus it was better. In any case, they drove off the Roman cavalry, came in behind the front, in conjunction with the cavalry on the right, on the near right of Roman left here, forced the Roman cavalry to leave the field. In the meantime, why the, the Romans here pushed back the center and stepped into the bag, so to speak. The Senate, the wings closed in, the cavalry came back, battle of encirclement, battle of annihilation, in which, depending upon the different accounts we read, uh, Hannibal lost around 7,000 troops. The Romans somewhere between 50,000 and 70,000. You can see what happens when they all start closing. They've got to change all their formations. In the meantime, they're falling them apart. They can't cope. They have to change front and everything else. Very ponderous, heavy body. So what's my point here? Well, there's a so-called principle of war called concentration. Well, if you look at that, the Romans more concentrated than Carthaginians. They lost. Marathon. Persians more concentrated than the Greeks. They lost. And you see this happening over and over. So the first few times the British and military people in this, they got very they said, wait a minute, that's unfair. You've got to think of concentration. They start throwing all the caveats in. Well, if you have to throw all the caveats in, the principle has no meaning. Many other time like that. What's the impression I'm trying to leave you? And it goes like this. If you look at any one of these battles, in one way or another, they're emphasizing unequal distribution as a basis for leverage and success. 
In fact, as we were talking about always, there's some kind of unequal distribution, uneven distribution. I remember getting leverage. The collapse rate is very pretty Well, if that's the case, unequal distribution is a key idea. Then, if you begin to think about it, concentration and dispersion are nothing more than aspects of unequal distribution. In other words, if you concentrate some areas, you disperse the others. They're both full under the idea of unequal distribution. Federation. Yet we don't have a principle of war called dispersion. We have a principle of war called concentration. We'll get into that later. We'll begin in my erosion, erosive attack upon the principle of war. You probably know. In any case, you begin to see these kind of things begin to play out. You see many authors, historians, other people notice the so-called moral effect. Disturbing effect of flank attack or surprise or those kind of things. How that builds doubt, fear, and all those kind of things people can't seem to cope. We don't know what it is yet. We're going to gather that information so we can sort of pin that down. See what we're talking about. With that in mind, let's push on. Come closer to the present. Let's look at Genghis Khan and the board. And we see some advantages he had over his adversary mobility, communication, intelligence, and leadership. Intelligence and return to their intelligence service. He has done mobility, Asiatic pony army. Each trooper had more than one pony. And those ponies were trained from birth to follow the, the pony the trooper was astride. They didn't have to have any feathers. So if one got tired, they just shift to another back and forth. They just go 50 and 60 miles a day, day after day, foraging, moving on their adversary. So in that context, in that sense, they had much greater mobility in their arms than their adversary. As a matter of fact, up to the present time, they had the greatest strategic mobility in the army in history. I'm not saying we should go back to Asiatic ponies. I'm not talking about a very broad well, sense, but we have to operate air and sea and other kinds of things. Only strategic kind of things. Communication. They operate in very wide array, very spread out in terms of between their major units. Yet they were able to operate in a concerted manner because they had not only messengers or courier service, signal devices like mirrors in them, so they could work together. Plus a great deal of previous training so each one could sort of understand what the other guy was doing without, obviously, a great deal of communication. We'll talk to that just a minute. Their intelligence service. They penetrated all the way down to Genoa and Venice, totally inside their adversary system. Their adversary didn't even know what they were up to. In other words, they were inside their adversary's mind. Or the adversary's orientation, which means you get inside sort of the human thing. Their leadership. Under the first great con, Genghis later, of a kind today we call you lead by general intention. Decide what's going to be done, the commanders on the spot determine how it's going to be carried out. They're responsible. Very important idea today, which we seem to violate and causes enormous difficulty. And the Athenians for operations indicated, not all the kinds of things they're doing here. The idea is to try to pull their adversary apart, exploit their vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Very fast paced, fast tempo operation. And also the use of propaganda and terror or to <coughs> destroy their adversary's resolve. And the way they would do it is an illustrative example. If they were going to take a city, if one city held out too long, it'd slaughter all but a few of the inhabitants left the other inhabitants go to the other city and say, if you surrender early, you're not going to have to go through this slaughter. That sort of breaks down resistance. <laughs> Another way they did it. So if they're going to take a, a province or a city and somebody was resisting too long, they'd march all the other citizens out front, so if they want to defend, they have to destroy their own citizens. I mean, these people weren't pleasant people. I'm not saying we should do that. I'm just saying that's what they did. Not the in any case, their aim is quite simple. But note what I say here. Why do we separate strategic maneuvers? Let me give you a feel for that by looking at this next schematic. Here we have a schematic of the invasion of the Persian Empire. The what empire? Charism Empire. Modern day Afghanistan area, you know, some of the areas where we've got problems in the world right now. And here we have these four. Units coming through as indicated here. Note the scale of mine. When you superimpose it over that, you find out that Genghis Khan is coming in on the front over 500 miles wide. Just take this mentally. 
We just do some close up here. We come in front of a 500 miles wide. 200,000 troops come in an area with 500 miles wide. Not only that, they were outnumbered by the Shaw and the Prison Empire. Outnumbered by their enemies. Matter of fact, the Mongols were almost always outnumbered by the enemies, yet they still don't. In any case, there's an early engagement by a Mongol detachment with a large portion of the Shah down here. And even though the Shah won the engagement, it so unnerved them, he stretched his forces out along his river, and the Mongols came up one by one. In the meantime, Genghis Khan came out of the desert and sacked the car. All of them came together and sacked Samarkand and conquered it. the prison empire. So, you know, that, that isn't much of a concentration when you have your forces spread out over five miles. Coming back with ideas. So it raises a rather interesting question, which military men particularly appreciate. Even though outnumbered, why were the models able to move and why they scattered the raids without being defeated separately or in detail? That's one of the reasons why you want to be concentrated, because armies worry about being defeated separately or in detail. If the models got away with it, well, maybe there's an important notion, an important idea there. Why were they able to get away with it? Can we? Surface that are bringing up in sharp relief. Let's attempt that. So here's the message and the result. I'll let you read it and I'll comment on it. Key point, the Mongols were able to operate at a faster tempo rhythm than their adversaries. Or is their adversary not? By being operated at a faster tempo or pace, by having advantage these kinds of things we've talked about, what does that permit them to do? They can play the dispersion concentration game in its widest possible sense. On the other hand, if you're operating very slowly and can't adapt very much, you better keep your forces together, otherwise you're going to be what? Defeated separately or detailed. Well, if you have the tempo or pace, you can play this dispersion concentration game with wide swaps, but since if you don't, you're going to be forced to operate in a more concentrated, more focused, less adaptive manner. Let me give you an illustration of that. How many people here have read uh, Clausewitz? Anybody? Well, in his book eight, he has a long discussion about the ideas of concentration and what he calls speed, or what we call tempo or pace. Long discussion, I heard. And in there, when he's talking about concentration, he laid out four exceptions to the idea of concentration. In terms of the idea of speed, no exceptions. Well, there's no exceptions to speed, and there are some of the concentration in the premier idea of speed, not concentration. Not only that, when you read very carefully those exceptions, you find out if you can operate at a faster tempo than you have then you're permitted to make those. You don't have to abide by the principle of concentration. Another illustration, and I'll preempt myself here again. The British found a North Africa early 1940s against Rome. One of the things they complained about when they lost, they weren't operating in a concentrated manner. And Rome was able to do it. They missed the whole point. The reason why Rome was able to take them out there for a while was because he's operating in a faster tempo or pace. Sometimes he's operating wide space raids, other times tight, he's working one between the other. So the key idea, if you can operate at a faster tempo or pace, it gives you greater freedom of action. You can play this dispersion concentration game as wide as possible sense. If not, then you're combined. Yet in our principles of war, we don't have a principle of speed, only a principle of concentration, which means we don't even understand that idea. But the Russians, in one of their principles of war, do have the principle of speed or tempo or pace. Remember, I said different countries, they lay out those principles differently. And out of many of those British concentration Well, yeah, not only that, they were also reading Rome's communication. Not only that, he was also in Europe when that attack took place. <laughs> they knew he was there. It was a medical leave. Did, did that limit the Germans' ability to maneuver because Rommel wasn't there? Well, no, they didn't know it was coming. So remember, they had a lot of deceptions. They had a beautiful deception campaign you want to read about. 
and all of a sudden this whole thing folded over. What you're saying is that the British were successful in this case. It's I'm going to intelligence and all yeah, that. Many things. Remember, when I'm talking about Rudolf, you're not just talking about speed. Remember, you've got to have as many things that fits in that. That'll become evidence when you go through it. I'm just laying on preemption. Yeah, you can go fast and you're right over a cliff. <laughs> no, we're a little bit more refined than that. <laughs> okay. That'll become evidence we go through. I'm just laying some preemptive here, though. You'll see that you'll get a feel for it. Remember, you don't have to be. There's, in fact, the question was raised to me in one of my discussions. I said, well, geez, each guy goes faster and faster. Pretty soon you're all going crazy. I said, no, you don't have to do it, though. You're thinking wrong. If he's fast, you have to be faster. If you're slow, you want him slower. You can always slow him down. As long as your pace is fast, it makes no difference whether you're going. Remember that. Relative. You don't have to go super fast. If you can't go fast, as long as you slow him down, then you're faster. Even if you're slow, he's slower. Same thing. Just keep that in mind. Don't, don't you lose your perspective. Because you'll see how it turns gorillas the way they go against their adversary. We say they go faster speed. They're not moving that fast. Their adversary is even slower than they have to keep that perspective in mind all the time. Like I said, otherwise just going speed over a cliff. I'm not talking about just physical cliffs, also mental cliffs. So I want to keep those perspectives in mind. Okay? With that in mind, let's come closer to the thread. Here's the Battle of White. The only reason why I show you this later theorist drew a great deal of significance from this battle. Matter of fact, John, he didn't get it that way wrong. But in any case, what we see here is we see the Austrians spread out, as indicated here. Frederick the Great was forced here. He was outnumbered greatly by the Austrians, I think about three to one. Came behind the screen hills and put his weight against the Austrian uh, wing here. Plus, he came to strike out some diversionary operations there and won a fantastic victory. Basically, all you're really seeing here is a more modern replay of the Battle of Lucan, a single outflank or a single assault. It's a more modern uh, replay of it. In that context. 